Welcome to MMC Online. We're Josh and Jana Baser, your online campus pastors. Hey, if you would let us know where you're watching from and who you're watching with, we want to connect with you all throughout the service. Yes, and pull out that MMC app. We love it when you check in and let us know that you're with us. Let us know your prayer requests and your praise reports. Um, we love thinking about you all through the week and, and we really pray over those. Yes. Hey, and also one cool thing that we have at Mount Moore's Church is we have an online campus Facebook group. And if you haven't joined that, man, I want to encourage you to go and join that right now because we do a lot of cool things in it and we, uh, we connect and we, we, we post a lot of content on there that you can interact with. And just, it's a really an opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. And you can also connect through the YouVersion Bible app. You can designate MMC as your church and then be sure to go back to that Facebook group that Josh was talking about because he will share the link and that's how we can actually comment together in that devotion. Yeah, and it's such a great way to grow. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you haven't already, be sure you like, love, and share this experience. Yes. It's a great mm -hmm. way to help get the broadcast out to more people so they can be impacted with yes. the Word of God. Next week is Sunday, September 25th. And we are going to three, three services. services. What times will those be? They're going to be at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. And our broadcast will be at the 10 a.m. service. Great. Yes. Okay. So not 9.30 next week, 10 o'clock. Yes. 10 okay. o'clock will be our broadcast. Yes. Great. Hey, we're going to get started here in just a minute. So grab some coffee, get your family together in your living room, stand up with us, and join us for Mountain Weavers Church.
those of you watching at home this morning, come on, put your hands together. Hey! What a sound in unison and harmony. So put our hands together and lift our voices this morning. I love making the devil mad with our Hey! My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that He wants to. Just ask the man who's thrown on the bones of Elijah. If there's anything that He can do, just ask the stone.
you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. You're always there for us. Every time we need you, no matter what life throws at us, you're always the same. And as I try to find the words this morning to thank you, words just don't seem like enough. I feel like I have nothing to bring to you, Jesus. And this song that we're getting ready to sing just expresses that so well, Lord. Our praise, our praise is what we have, Lord. We bring that to you this morning. As we throw up our hands, we outstretch them towards you. As we shout from the depths of our heart, Lord Jesus, over and over and over again, we express our gratitude.
so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. And so that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing that's fit for a king. we could give you, there's nothing we could do except to give you our praise, to thank you, God, for who you are, God who created the universe, who formed us in our mother's womb, who wrote the story of our life before one day was ever lived out, who loves us and calls us by name. God, today, we don't have much, but God, what we have we bring to you. God, we lay it at your feet this morning, Jesus. We bring all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, God. Lord, we lift our hands of gratitude and we say thank you, Jesus. Come on, in your own words this morning with your own voice, can you just say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Giver of life, giver of hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, have your way in this place today. God, open our hearts and our minds, God, to receive a word that you want for us. Speak to us each individually, God, where we're at today. God, allow us today, Father God, to be challenged. Mold and shape us into your image, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said... Those service times are going to be 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Now listen, that's on campus. If you are part of the online family, your service times is changing. So 10 a.m. is going to be the live service for all of our online family. What time? So they'll get to sleep in a little bit. Yeah. Which is nice. Yes, you can sleep in, grab a cup of coffee, and then come at 10 a.m for your live experience online family. Guys, invite your friends. This is an exciting time because we are making room for more people to experience the real and life-changing hope of Jesus Christ. So share on social, invite your friends. We will see you on campus next week at 8.30, 10 or 11.30 and online family, you join us at 10 a.m. 
crazy exciting times. Everything that God is doing just is absolutely blowing our mind. And speaking of crazy times, we're living in crazy times, not yes, just in America, but around the globe. We've seen it for the last few years and uh, really the world has never been in, a, in a, a, a state like it is right now. The world is just crazy. What in the world is going on? So today we are really excited. We are really privileged and honored to be able to offer to you a message from Fellowship Church, uh, a partnership with Ed Young. And this is Jimmy Evans, who is yes. one of the world's leading Bible teachers on end time prophecy. If you don't know about him, you really need to look him up on YouTube. He has an incredible program called The Tipping Point. He's written a book called The Tipping Point uh, along with other books. And he just really is uh, an expert in this field and, and uh, he brings incredible information to the stage when it comes to understanding the days and the times that we're living in in respect to Bible prophecy. It's so exciting. And so uh, we hope that you will just stay tuned and join us and enjoy today's message, What in the World is Going On with Jimmy Evans. My message today is called, What in the World is Going On? <laughs> and I'm going to talk about Russia. I want to talk about the real events that are happening in the world right now. Very, very significant events that are happening, uh, especially right now in Russia, but also pertaining to the nation of Israel. And I want to ask and answer three questions in this message and the first question is, how do we know we're living in the end times? You know, just about every generation of Christians since Jesus has believed they were living in the end times. So someone might ask you, how do you know that you're living in the end times and you're not just, you know, pretending that you are? Joel chapter 3 is a very important text. And this is God in the first person speaking through the prophet Joel. Here's what he says. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. And so God here is saying, in the time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, there's also gonna be Armageddon. In the same period of time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem from all over the world, all the nations of the world, there's gonna be Armageddon. I'm gonna bring all nations down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The Jehoshaphat means Jehovah has judged and the Valley of Jehoshaphat is the valley between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. And that's where Jesus, according to Zechariah 14, Jesus' feet will touch the Mount of Olives when he returns. So this is the, the uh, Battle of Armageddon. Israel has been dispossessed twice. Israel is the only nation in the history of the world that has been dispossessed twice and come back to be a nation. The first time they were dispossessed was around 500 BC. Uh, because of their sins, God allowed the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, to defeat the Jews. They took them captive from Israel, took them to Babylon. While they were in Babylon, Persia defeated Babylon, and that became Persia. So at the end of the 70 years, they were able to go back and literally revive their nation. That's the first time it happened. But they only went back from one nation. They only went back from Persia. They only went back from Babylon where they were taken. The second time Israel was dispossessed was in AD 70. Jesus prophesied this in Luke 21. In AD 70, the Roman general Titus with the Roman legion came and defeated the Jews, killed over a million Jews, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple and raised the temple mount, took the remaining Jews hostage, captive, back to Rome, they were ultimately scattered all over the world. So God is saying, you've scattered my people all over the world, but I'm, I'm regathering them. That has happened in, on May the 14th of 1948, Israel came into existence for the second time. Isaiah 11, God says, I will again for the second time take my hand and regather my people from all the nations. So they've been dispossessed twice, they've come back to life twice, it's unheard of. But on May 14th of 1948, the British mandate ended and David Ben-Gurion, the leader of Israel, declared their independence. On the same day, President Harry Truman, our president, recognized Israel as a nation. Many other nations followed suit. So literally, in one day, in May of 1948, Israel became a nation. This is Isaiah 66. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. The rebirth of Israel on May 14th of 1948 was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 66. 
And so God is saying this, in the same period of time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, May 14th of 1948, in that same period of time, Armageddon is going to happen. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 24. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches become already become tender and puts forth its leaves, its leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, he was talking about the end times, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So Jesus says the generation that sees the beginning of the end will see the end of the end. Now the beginning started, God told us from his perspective, the end started when he brought back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem in 1948. So the last days began. Every generation has had signs of the end times. Every generation has had earthquakes. Every generation has had famines. Every generation has had pestilences. Every generation has some evil person they thought was the Antichrist. But we're the only generation that has the existence of Israel. That's what makes us different. That's why we know we're living in the end time. Israel has to exist for dozens of end times prophecies to come true. For there to be a covenant with the Antichrist in Israel, they have to exist. For the abomination of desolation to take place, they have to exist and there has to be a rebuilt temple. For the two witnesses to come, there has to be existence of Israel. So Israel has to exist and they have existed since 1948. So Jesus said the generation that sees these things will see all things fulfilled. God says, at the same time I bring back Israel, Armageddon's going to happen in that same period of time. So a really important question is, how long is the generation? Jesus said that generation won't pass away. How long is the generation? Well, one of the important things about Bible interpretation is the Bible interprets the Bible. So Psalm chapter 90 says this, the days of a man's life are 70 years, or if by reason of strength, they're 80 years. Now I'm 68. I don't like that scripture. <laughs> I don't like it at all. So the days of a man's life are 70 years, 70 years is a generation, or possibly 80 years. Well, how long has it been since Israel was reborn as a nation? It's been 74 years. So if a generation is 80 years, we have six years left. Now, I'm not setting dates. I'm just telling what the Bible says. And so in God's mind, the end times is a compressed period of time. It doesn't go on for two or 300 years. It goes on for one generation, however long that is. Okay, so God says in the same period of time, that I do this, I'm gonna do this because I'm mad. And I'm mad for two reasons. I'm mad because the way you treated my people and you've scattered them around the world and I'm mad because you're dividing up my land. God calls the nation of Israel his land, okay? So is it true that we're dividing up the land of Israel? Well, Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey. It's a tiny, tiny little nation. Uh, if you put Israel into Lake Michigan, there'd be room left over. So it's this tiny little nation in the Middle East, and we have been dividing it up since 1948, since they got there. So this is a book called Eye to Eye by a man named William Koenig, and the subtitle of his book is Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. Okay. And so in his book, he has 126 specific examples of when the United States has tried to force Israel to give up land and natural disasters, historic natural disasters that have happened as a result, and let me give you a couple of examples of that. In uh, 2005, the United States, under the George W. Bush administration, the United States forced Israel, along with the United Nations, we forced them to give up the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is this piece of land on the Mediterranean, very lucrative piece of land, but the Palestinians said, that's our land, and if you give us the, that land, we'll have peace with you, land for peace. Okay. The, they gave them the Gaza Strip and they shoot rockets out of it. Okay. There is no land for peace. And so we forced Israel out of the Gaza. Five days later, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. Historic damage, worst, worst natural disaster in American history at that time. Immediately, Jewish rabbis came out and said, that's what God does because you made us give up the Gaza Strip. Another example. Last December, there was a 230 mile long tornado. Some of you may remember it. An F4 tornado, this horrifically powerful tornado that hit four states in four hours, did most of its damage in the state of Kentucky. 230 mile long, historic tornado, historic damage. What was happening at Israel at the same time? The Biden administration at exactly the same time was trying to force the Israelis 
to stop building 9,000 houses in a settlement in East Jerusalem because the Biden administration doesn't recognize East Jerusalem as belonging to the Jews. They believe it belongs to the Palestinians. And they are trying to pressure the Israelis to give up East Jerusalem, the, uh, the West Bank, their settlements in the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. And what that means is 200,000 Jews lose their homes in East Jerusalem, 400,000 Jews lose their homes in the West Bank, and they give up the Golan Heights, which is an incredibly militarily strategic area of Israel. This is what the Biden administration is doing. You remember the Trump administration recognized Jerusalem as belonging to Israel, and we put our embassy there. This is not political. This is just facts. And so the Trump administration recognized Jerusalem, the first world leader since King Cyrus of Persia that recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And so we now see our current administration is trying to force them out. When this historic tornado hit, the Biden administration was trying to force the Jews to stop building 9,000 houses in East Jerusalem. They also announced that they were gonna open a consulate for the Palestinians in East Jerusalem. In other words, an embassy. They were recognizing East Jerusalem as belonging to the Palestinians. And so God says, I'm ticked. And I'm gonna tell you why I'm mad. I'm mad because of how you're treating the Jews and I'm mad because you're dividing up my land. And it's happening. 126 specific examples in this book of when we tried to force the Jews to give up land and historic natural disasters that happened as a result. So this is true. The, the Joel 3, the text that I'm reading you here, this is current events that's happening right now. But in God's mind, the end started May the 14th of 1948 when he began bringing back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. When the Iron Curtain fell in 1991, 1.1 million Jews immigrated from Russia back to Israel. So since 1948, the Jews have been coming from all over the world back to the nation of Israel, exactly the way God said would happen. So that's my first question. How do we know we're living in the end times? My answer is the existence of Israel. Israel is God's super sign and stopwatch related to the end times. Everything starts there and everything ends there with Armageddon. Number two question, what is the significance of what is happening with Russia right now? Now the Ukraine is not necessarily a prophetic place. Russia is a highly prophetic place. Russia is a major player in the end times and Ezekiel 38 and 39 gives us prophecies that tell us what, where Russia will be and what Russia will do in the end times. This is Ezekiel 38. The word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Rosh is Russia, Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him and say, thus said the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, the great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north, remember that phrase from the far north, and its troops, many people are with you. So let me talk about the players here. Now this, this prophecy is against one man. This man is named Gog, and he's the leader of Russia. And God says here, you prophesy against this man who's the leader of Russia. And you say to him, listen to me, Gog, I'm against you, and I'm gonna put hooks in your jaw. The hook was an animal hook. When you had a stubborn mule that wouldn't do what you wanted it to do, you would put a hook in its mouth and drag it around, force it to go where you wanted it to go. And what God is saying here is, hey, Vladimir, you don't make the decisions here. I'm gonna make the decisions for you. Today, I would say Vladimir Putin is God. Now, if this is gonna happen years in the future, God could be somewhere else. But now we have a leader in Russia who's a very evil man. You're seeing in Ukraine how evil Vladimir Putin is. Bombing women and children, bombing nursing homes, bombed a mosque and killed the people in it that were hiding there. This is an evil man and Ukraine is not his end game. He wants to reassemble the former Soviet Union and even take over parts of Europe more than likely. So this is, this is a new Hitler uh, in, on a rampage. This is the most aggressive military action that's been taken since World War II. And so God is saying here, I'm against you, God leader of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And he lists all these nations that are gonna be with Gog in this invasion of Israel. And let me just put a map up here because I wanna show you this map. I think it's helpful to actually see the map. Now you'll notice, right, all the arrows are pointing to Israel. And if you'll just put a circle around Israel there, right in the middle of the map there, that's it. Israel's the tiny, that's, all of that's not Israel. That's part of Iraq and Jordan and Syria. That tiny little area there, uh, to the left of that circle, that's the nation of Israel. 
about the size of the state of New Jersey. Now, remember I said, remember the term to the far north? God says, you're going to be coming from the far north. So when the Bible gives directions, it's always giving them from Jerusalem. When the Bible says north, it means north of Jerusalem. When it means south, it's south of Jerusalem. Okay, so you're going to come from the far north. If you go from Jerusalem, right there in Israel, directly north, you hit Moscow. R Rosh is Russia at the top of the map. That's Russia. You'll notice Ukraine is there to the left. Now, the Ukraine could be biblically a part of Rosh, especially East Ukraine, which is historically Russian. So the Ukraine could be a part of that. Magog, the mention, Ezekiel 38 mentions Magog. Today, that's Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan. That's the Stan Club. If your name ain't Stan, don't apply. <laughs> that's the Stan Club right there. Then Gomer, Togarma, Meshach, and Tubal. This is modern-day Turkey. That's the nation of Turkey. Okay. And so then when you go over here to the left, Put, that's Libya, could be Algeria, parts of Tunisia, that's Northern Africa. And then Ethiopia, this is modern day Sudan. Okay. So these are all the nations that are mentioned there. Uh, by the way, Persia is Iran. Okay, right here. This is modern day Iran. Iranians are not Arabs, they're Persians. And by the way, the, the Iranians are precious people, the, the nation. There's a huge revival happening in Iran. The leaders of Iran are crazy, crazy, crazy. The people are precious. The Palestinian people are precious. The Russian people are precious. Don't judge people because of their crazy leaders. They have a bunch of crazy leaders, but the people are precious. So, so Iran is, these are all players. So you say, well, what, what do these nations have in common? Okay. Do they have anything in common? They're all allies of Russia and they all hate Israel. These are all Muslim nations except for Russia. Okay. And Russia is very, very angry at Israel right now. Okay. So all of 2,600 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel sits down and writes this prophecy. It's exactly what's happening in the world right now. Exactly. All these nations are in their place. They're all politically and militarily aligned and they all hate Israel. They would attack Israel in a heartbeat if they could. Okay. So those are the nations. The question is, why are they attacking? For what purpose are they attacking Israel? Ezekiel 38. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited in the latter years. That's the Old Testament way of saying last days. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus saith the Lord God. On that day it will come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. So there are three reasons stated of why these nations are going to invade Israel. To take booty and plunder, number one. Number two, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, to get the land back. That's what I said. They want the land back. Number three, to stretch out your hand against the people gathered from the nations, the Jews. To kill the Jews, to get the land back, and to take their goods. Okay, so there's two groups of people that are going to invade. There are the Russians, and there are the Muslims. And they have two completely different agendas of why they're going to invade. For the Russians, their motive is 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas off the coast of Israel. Now, 10 years ago, if you would have asked me, what did Israel have that Russia would attack them for to, to take booty and plunder? I just say, I don't, unless you enjoy swimming in the Dead Sea, I don't know. You know, there's nothing in Israel that valuable. In the last seven or eight years, Israel has discovered in two gas fields off of its shores in the Mediterranean, 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. You say, why is that important? Because Europe buys one third of their natural gas from Russia. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline was being built from Russia to Germany to supply Germany and Europe. They shut it off. Germany shut it down because of the invasion of the Ukraine. That cost Israel, or that cost Russia billions of dollars. So Russia is losing, their, their number one uh, uh, part of their economy is energy. They're losing natural gas business. See, Europe hates buying natural gas from Vladimir Putin. 
He constantly manipulates you and controls you when he has that kind of power over you. When they invaded the Ukraine in the dead of winter, they shut off half of Ukraine's natural gas so they could just barely heat their homes. They wouldn't give them the gas until they gave up their country. And so Russia is a horrible provider of energy. Now their number one competitor is Israel, the nation of Israel. And Russia is very angry with Israel because Israel came out and denounced the invasion of the Ukraine and stood with the Ukrainians. The day after they did that, Russia's ambassador to the United Nations declared in the United Nations that Russia no longer recognizes Israel's right over the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights sits high above the Galilee area in Israel. It's a strategic advantage. It's on the border of Syria. It's a strategic advantage to whoever has it. The last time Syria had it was before the Six Day War in 1967. And when they had it, they used it to bomb Israel. Israel took over the Golan Heights to keep Syria from doing that again. Russia now declared, we don't recognize the Golan Heights as belonging to Israel, which means if Syria attacks it, Russia will support them. And by the way, Russia and Iran are currently on the northern border of Israel, ready to attack. Al-Assad, the leader of Syria, is a puppet for Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin controls that entire area of the world we were just looking at. He either directly controls or he heavily influences every nation that we just listed in the Gog Magog conspiracy. So Russia has a huge interest in the natural gas of Israel. They want the, and all their friends are Muslims that hate Israel and they have another purpose there. So I believe the booty and the plunder, that's gonna be, uh, be Russia's agenda, to get down there and to take 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. They would lock up the market in that entire area of the world on natural gas. So why are the Muslims attacking? They have a completely separate agenda. Now we have an eschatology, uh, I'm teaching you eschatology right now. Eschatology is a study of the end times, okay? The Muslims also have their own eschatology. So let me talk about Iran, okay? We all know the Muslims hate the Jews. Most of them will not recognize their right to exist with the exception of the Abraham Accords that are taking place, especially on the Saudi Peninsula. And so uh, Iran is not Iran. Iran is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran is officially a Muslim nation. And Iran is not run by politicians. They have a parliament. Iran is run by mullahs and the Ayatollah. Iran is run by... Uh, leaders of the Muslim faith. It would be like the Congress of the United States having to report to a group of pastors and one pastor being over them. And so the religious leaders of Iran believe that Allah has called them to destroy Israel and to usher in the end times. They believe that's their call as a nation. And their eschatology is this. They will attack Israel. They will destroy Israel. And when they do that, the hidden Imam who is their Messiah, will come into Jerusalem along with Jesus. And Jesus will tell the world that he's a Muslim and call on all the world to convert to Islam. That's their, that's their, they have to destroy Israel for the hidden imam to come and for the end times. That's their eschatology. And so they, they have told Israel on multiple occasions, we do not recognize your right to exist and we're gonna destroy you. They've told them a hundred times they're gonna destroy them. They've been enriching uranium for years, but they haven't been close until now of getting enough enriched uranium to build a bomb. Last summer, Benny Gantz, who's the defense minister of Israel, said Iran is eight weeks away from having enough enriched uranium for one bomb. That was last summer. It's believed right now by the international intelligence community that Iran probably has enough enriched uranium for one bomb. Up until now, they didn't have enough enriched uranium and they didn't have a ballistic missile that could reach Israel. And then they came out with this missile. This has the range to hit the nation of Israel. And you see that Arabic inscription on the left side of the missile there. That missile is named after a battle where the Muslims beat the Jews. In other words, they built a missile and put Israel's name on it. So they've been enriching uranium they have, it's now believed they have enough enriched uranium for one bomb. They now have a delivery mechanism for that. And Israel has put this year in their budget $5 billion in their budget to bomb Iran. They have been conducting massive military drills practicing bombing Iran. They have told the Russians, we're going to bomb Iran. If they keep enriching uranium, we're gonna, they've told America, we're going to bomb Iran. If they keep enriching uranium, because 
Iran is an existential threat to the nation of Israel. Israel cannot afford to let them have any nuclear weapons. And they're on the verge right now, it is believed, of having the enriched uranium and the delivery mechanism to bomb Israel. Now, there's been these talks in Vienna, which are, which are the biggest joke in the entire world. The Iranians have been playing the entire world while they've been building all their nuclear uh, stuff. We were prepared to pay them. The United States was willing to prepare prepared to pay Iran billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars if they would agree to any nuclear deal, but they got to keep their enriched uranium and they got, get to keep their centrifuges. That's like having to tie a pork chop around your neck to get the dog to play with you. That's when you know you're really desperate. And so we have this terrible deal trying to make with Iran just to have a deal. And Israel has a completely separate agenda. Israel has to bomb Iran. Remember that God says, I'm gonna put a hook in your jaw and I'm gonna drag you down. This is my personal opinion I'm about to share. I believe that Israel's about to bomb Iran. I don't, think, I don't think there's any way that they can not bomb Iran. They have to stop Iran. It's in their budget. They've been practicing it. They've been announcing it. If they get closer, we're not going to let Iran get a bomb. They're gonna kill us with it if they do. And so they're gonna bomb Iran. That will provoke Russia and the Muslim nations to attack Israel. This is my opinion. Russian scientists are all over the Iranian nuclear installations. Russia has helped to supply and fund the money for all the Iranians are doing uh, with their nuclear program. And so when Israel bombs Iran, they're gonna kill a bunch of Russians. And Russia has warned the United States repeatedly, and they have warned Israel repeatedly, if you strike Iran, You'll have, you'll have us to answer for it. They've told us this. And by the way, you know, we've put all the sanctions on Russia. Do you know what Russia said to the United States? That's fine, you can sanction us, but you can't sanction our dealings with Iran. We want the dealings with Iran to be out of the, out of the picture with the sanction deal. They have a very, very strong relationship with Iran. Okay, so there's one more other question I wanna ask and answer. Well, by the way, the question is, how does this war end? This is Ezekiel 38. This is the Gog Magog War. It will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord my God, that my fury will show in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog, Throughout all my mountains, says the Lord, every man's sword will be against his brother. I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops and the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And so God is going to kill Gog and all the nations that come down. Israel won't have to fire a bullet. God himself will miraculously destroy all these nations that attack Israel. And he will sanctify himself in the sight of the nation. So the first question I ask is, how do we know we're living in the end times? Okay, the existence of Israel as a nation. My second question is, how does Russia tie into that? And I showed you how Russia, Gog and Magog, very much ties in with what's happening in Russia, Iran, Israel, all of that right now. My third question is, when's it gonna happen? When, when is the Gog-Magog war going to happen? When, when are they going to attack Israel? Okay, well, there's, four th there's a text in Ezekiel 38 that I won't read. Before things have to happen, before they attack, Israel must be restored back to their land after it had long been desolate. Check that box. Israel must have come back from many nations. That's true. They must be dwelling securely and they must be prosperous. They're filthy rich. The Israelis are filthy rich. Their tech, their tech sector is incredibly successful. They have 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. They export huge amounts of agricultural produce. The Dead Sea has a billion tons of chemicals in it. The Israelis are rich beyond belief. Okay. The only question is, are they dwelling securely? Because some people say, this can't happen right now because they're not dwelling securely. Let me just tell you, Israel is the most powerful nation in the Middle East. Even though they have a lot of enemies, they're dwelling securely because they have the most incredible military force you've ever seen. And so in my opinion, this is gonna happen before the rapture. This will happen around the time of the rapture and this will set up the, uh, the covenant with the Antichrist that begins the tribulation period of time. So let me, let me say in response to this message, because I wanted to give you some context for what's happening in Russia and all those things. I can't predict what's gonna happen to the Ukraine and things like that, but I am telling you how this ends related to Israel. Uh, so how do you respond to this message? Well, here's what I would say. Everything I've just told you, 
I want you to know our God is in control. Thousands of years ago, <laughs> Vladimir Putin is God's puppet. Iran is God's puppet. These people are not in control. They're being controlled by God. God will use them for the very purpose he wants to use them for. The end times are God's times. And so the main thing in talking about Bible prophecy is if you're a believer, you should be comforted to know two things, that God predicted all of this would happen. He's in control of it. And we're not gonna be here when the worst of it happens. Jesus is coming for us. And I talked about that in my last message. Jesus is coming for us. We ought to be comforted. And I want you to be able to comfort people who are very upset about what's happening in the world right now. Jesus predicted, by the way, one of the things that would happen in the end were famines. The Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. The U Ukraine, they're rationing flour in Lebanon right now. The Ukraine supplies Lebanon with their grain. And so what's happening in Ukraine right now will affect the world food supply, which is already fragile. Last year, the head of the UN World Food Bank said, if we don't have billions of dollars poured in to the World Food Bank, we're gonna watch famines of biblical proportions in the last several years. That was before what's happening in the Ukraine and Russia right now. And so the world is set up right now for what Jesus said would happen in the end times. And it means that Jesus is coming. It means that God is in control. And it means we need to be living our lives for Jesus. And I said to you last time, and I'll say it again, plan like Jesus isn't coming back for 100 years. Get an education, get a job, build a house, have children, get married and have children. Get married first, <laughs> then have children. Don't have children and get married, okay? But get married, have children, but live like Jesus is coming back today. Be ready for Jesus. He's gonna come back. Everything the Bible said would happen in the end is happening right before our very eyes. And if any generation of people ever needed to be ready, we need to be ready. Don't stop living your life, but look up. Your redemption's drawing near. What an incredible message by Jimmy Evans. I hope that it was an encouragement to you. If you're a believer, I, I'm sure it was an encouragement to you because we know that um, we're not gonna be around for the worst of it all. We know that times, though they're really, really tough and uncertain right now things are really according to bible prophecy things are only going to continue to get worse but aren't you glad that jesus is coming back for his spotless bride and we as his church we just need to make sure that we are ready and that we're encouraging and comforting one another with these words that jesus is coming soon but more importantly than that you know, we know that our salvation is secure. We know where we're going to spend eternity. We know that uh, we're gonna be sitting at the, the marriage supper of the lamb and, and it won't be long, but what about those who don't know Jesus? What about those that we know and love? What if maybe you are that person watching today and you don't know Jesus as your personal savior? Listen, uh, prophecy is incredible because it, it really just validates the fact that the word of God is true and God is who he says he is. There is so much evidence out there that points to the fact that God is real, that Jesus is the Son of God. And there's no better time than now, no really more important time than now, than for you to realize that He is who He says He is and to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, to make Him Lord of your life. We encourage you to do that today. So if you can, right now, I would like to just encourage all of you joining us online. Let's bow our heads and I wanna say a prayer with you, especially those that would like to make this life-changing, eternal decision to make heaven your home. Father, we love you so much and we thank you, God, for your presence. I thank you for today's message. I thank you for Jimmy Evans and his teachings and for Pastor Ed and this incredible uh, message that was brought to us today from Fellowship Church, God. Lord, we pray that you would let today's message sink deep in our hearts, God, that we would truly understand by the power and the leading of your Holy Spirit the times that we are living in. Help us to understand, God, how incredibly close we are to the soon coming return of Jesus Christ. God, we pray today that you would just begin to move on the hearts of your people, your church, that we would begin truly just comforting each other with these words of hope that Jesus is coming, but that as your church, we would understand the times that we are in. And furthermore, God, we would be driven by eternity to reach out to those that we know and love that don't know you. God, that we would share that contagious hope of Jesus Christ with those around us, that they might come to know you the way we know you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask those of you that are watching online today, if you don't know Jesus and you want to make him Lord of your life, we're praying that you would make that decision today. And 
what we want to do right now is we want to lead you through a prayer that will help you to make this decision. So if you would repeat this prayer with us today, just say, Father, Father I, love I love you and I thank you, and I thank you for, who you are. for who you are. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart, Cleanse my heart of, all unrighteousness. of all unrighteousness. Make my slate clean. Make my slate clean. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of he God. He is who He says He is. He is who He says He is. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus that He would be in my heart. He would be in my heart. Live in my heart. Live in my heart. Be the ruler over my heart. Be the ruler over I my heart. I confess Him as King of my life today. I confess Him as King of my life today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And you said, Amen. amen. As we say, Amen. And listen, if you did make that decision, I want to encourage you to comment in the comment section below all in and that'll let us know that you made that life-changing decision. That's right. Also, will you just text life change to 844-MMC next? If you made that decision, text life change to 844-MMC next. That's going to give you a message from Brad and I on what your very next step is after you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Thank you for joining us on our online service today. Now more than ever is your chance to give back and share the hope of Jesus. In the Bible it says that whenever we give our 10% back to God, He's going to pour abundance of blessings on us. Here at MMC, there's three different ways that you can give. You can give on our website, mountainmoverschurch.org, or you can mail your offering to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma. Lastly, you can give on our MMC app. We can't wait to see you next week online or on campus for the launch of our three services. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for this awesome day. I thank you for the service that you provided us today and for just the ability to connect and reach together online. God, just bless this week and just let us go out and share the love and hope of Jesus. And we just thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.